and two it does seem to reduce the prevalence of any soil borne diseases but it does not what's up lazy dog fam hope everybody out there is having a wonderful day feels nice and fallish out here this afternoon got a few things we need to do in the garden first i want to show you these no-till pumpkins behind me and some recent developments there we got these fall taters right here beside those pumpkins we need a side dress and we need to heal those and then we're going to head on over to the raised bed plot we need to continue along with our fall planting where we're going to be planting one of my favorite things to grow for fall so several videos ago i showed you a comparison between the fall pumpkins we had planted in our tilled plots versus in this no-till plot here and the no-till pumpkins were looking considerably better than the pumpkins in the tilled plot and i've since kind of scratched some of those pumpkins in the tilled plot so we can just get them out of the way and plant a cover crop so these here behind me in the no-till plot these polar bear pumpkins were looking really really good until about a couple weeks ago things started going downhill so for quite a while there this entire plot look like this little section right here just green lush growth no real signs of disease just looking amazing but in the last couple of weeks some type of pest has gotten in here especially in this middle area and you can see the damage they have done just a stark contrast there between that plant growth there and this in the middle that's just been decimated now I hadn't really sprayed this particular pumpkin patch until yesterday. I was spraying some azara on some brassicas that we planted in the last week where I know I'm going to have some pest issues. Had a little leftover in the tank so I did treat this. Now I don't know if I'll be able to stop the bleeding or not. But I didn't spray them before that because everything was looking so good. Then it just kind of went downhill really really fast. Now I don't think we're going to get completely skunked here, but that damage in the middle certainly isn't going to help things. We've got a few nice pumpkins around the outside here. That one there is a little bit bigger than a basketball. Then we've got another one right here on the edge of the plot that's looking pretty good. And there's a few more small ones in there coming along as well. So it looks like we're still going to get at least a few nice porch pumpkins for fall. Just maybe not as many as we originally planned to get from this planting here. But all this happening kind of has got me thinking a little bit more about the no-till plot and this process here. And what I've heard about, you know, why no-till is so great. Now if you've been following our gardening journey for a while, you know that I wasn't always a huge fan of no-till gardening. I was pretty skeptical about it in the beginning, but that's why we started this no-till plot, just to see if it was all that people said it was. So there's a couple of the touted benefits of no-till gardening that I've kind of came around on, so to speak, over the last couple of years growing stuff in this particular plot. So one of those benefits that we've seen in this plot behind me here is that the reduced tillage does enhance the soil life. We get a lot more fungi in the soil, a lot more fungal associations going on, and that seems to make the plants less dependent on subsequent fertilizations, seems to make them grow better without giving them as much. And then the second thing we've noticed in this no-till plot is that the plants seem to have less disease issues. Now, I don't quite understand that one completely yet i'm sure it ties back to the soil biology there but with these pumpkins we really haven't had any powdery mildew or downy mildew that i've seen and the conditions up until it cooled off a week or so ago were perfect for a lot of mildew on these plants now there's one touted benefit of no-till gardening that i'm not quite buying yet and that has to do with the insect damage we've seen here now i haven't heard this from every no-till gardener out there but i have heard no-till proponents say that the reduced tillage is going to make your plants less susceptible to being attacked by insects because the uh, chemistry of the plants is different but as we can see in this case here that didn't really matter these plants were as lush and healthy as they could be but they still got attacked and wiped out pretty quick by some type of insect so i'll give you those two growing in a no-till situation does seem to reduce the amount of fertilizers that you have to give the plants and two it does seem to reduce the prevalence of any soil-borne diseases but it does not 
prevent flying insects from coming in there and taking down a plot pretty quick. So now that we've covered our current thoughts on the no-till situation, we need to focus on these fall taters here, which are looking pretty decent. They're looking better than my fall taters did last year. Didn't get a full row of any of the three varieties we planted. But we got pretty close to it with these two rows, the red taters and the huckleberry gold. Baltic rows still a little slow to come up, and I don't know if these got enough time to really make any decent sized taters, but these two rows right here still look pretty promising. And I tried to get him on camera, but he jumped away. I just saw a grasshopper right there. Now, I've never really had any issues with grasshoppers around here. That's got me thinking. I wonder if grasshoppers did that. If y'all have ever had any significant grasshopper damage in your garden, let me know if it looks like that. But back to the taters here. So some of these plants are pretty decent size and we probably should have already healed them. But I was kind of waiting to all the slow sprouting plants caught up a little bit so that we can kind of heal the row all at once. I've been pruning back these pumpkin vines about once a week. Been able to keep them off the taters for the most part, but I think we're gonna have to prune them back just a hair bit more if we want to heal these taters with a hoe. All right, so we got those pumpkins pruned back a little bit more, give us a little room to work there, pull some soil up around those tater plants. Got one pumpkin there. It's about as big as a volleyball, and I wanted to be careful not to move it too much. I wish it was further away, but we'll work around that one. We got some Nature Safe 855 in our bucket here, gonna do one scoop per row. Go dogs. We got our healing hoe. And so we're gonna heal these red taters pretty high because those plants are pretty big. Not going to heal these huckleberry gold plants as high because those plants aren't as big. Some of those in the middle there aren't very big at all. And then we're going to do some selective healing on this row of Baltic rose taters. Still going to side dress the entire row in case we get some late sprouts there. But we're just going to heal where we see taller plants. Got them healed up there. Probably put a little overhead water on these late this afternoon because it's pretty dry around here. That was easy healing with that real soft no-till dirt there. Got them plants nestled up in that hill. And we still have about two months, just based on averages, until we get our first frost. So should be able to get a good bit more growth out of these plants here before we need to dig them. So as I told y'all before, these are no teal taters. These are not no heel taters. I do realize some people that grow no teal don't heal their taters, but I like to heal mine. Now let's go plant some stuff. So the last time I showed you our new raised bed garden, I had started mulching some of the walkways, but hadn't gotten very far. I've gotten a lot further since then. We're almost done with it. I've got a little section right over there, and then I've got these edges I need to cover up and kind of square up around the entire plot. We've almost got it entirely mulched. Really happy with how it's looking so far. And also last time we were in here, I showed you how we're setting up that little elbow valve and T combination there. So we can run our drip tape in these beds and keep our plants happy. We also got a couple little rows of red cabbage and rutabagas planted. Those are hanging in there pretty good. Starting to put on a little bit of new growth. Not a lot yet, but I imagine these are going to take off pretty soon. And then right beside that bed, Brooklyn and I came in here yesterday and planted this one. So same kind of drip set up here. We're trying to pack these full of veggies to so plant everything real close. Got a row of zinnias there on the back side of that bed. Got a little leggy on me in the greenhouse. Probably need to prune the top of those so they'll bush out a little bit more. Got two little rows of basil here, some Genovese, lemon, and Thai basil. And then on this end row, got some dill and some cilantro planted. So we've got two beds planted and we got 11 more to go. Now I haven't been in a super huge hurry to get stuff planted in these beds. We're just knocking out one or two beds a day. Most of the stuff we're planting in here survives the winter just fine down here. So I don't have to be in a huge rush. I was in a huge rush to get the beds in place, get them filled and get the irrigation set up. 
now things are moving at a slower pace we can relax and enjoy ourselves a little bit more so today we're going to try to get this bed right here planted and that one right behind it planted so i came in here earlier today and went ahead and set up my main line for these two beds we're going to be planting today got my valve in place there got my t in place got my end caps so all we need to do is plug a few lines of drip tape in here and we'll be ready to plant so one of those beds is going to get two different types of kale and then the other bed is going to get some of these babies right here one of my favorite things to grow in the cooler months and that would be collards now some people think that collards are just a southern thing but they don't have to be this is one of the most cold hardy vegetables you can plant so if you live in an area that gets fairly cold you can probably still grow some collards throughout the winter these things are pretty tough and they'll take a good freeze so the first thing we need to do here is make us a couple little planting furrows and i'm thinking with these collards i can really only squeeze two rows in this bed because they'll bush out and get pretty big so I'm gonna go in the center of the main line on this side, make a furrow, and then same thing over here. Now I've got me a couple pieces of drip tape here that are cut almost close to length. We might have to trim them up on the ends a little bit. We need to hook these up to the main line. Now on the other beds, I use the row starts with the valves on them. Here I'm just using the regular row starts, one because I ran out of the ones with valves, and two because since we're planting the same thing here, we should not have any issues with one row still being there and another row not. So with these beds where we have the same thing planted in the entire bed, I'm not going to be worried about using the ones without the valves. So let's punch this hole in here where our row start is going to go, just like that insert that and do the other one now let me show you something here that i've learned so far as far as doing drip like this in a raised bed versus an in-ground garden with larger rows so when we're doing this in the in-ground garden it doesn't really matter where we cut our tape where we trim it up to connect it to the main line as long as we don't cut it too close to one of these hard emitters right here but in the raised beds it does matter because we only have so much length of the raised bed to work with and want to maximize the number of emitters that we have along this little row here so what i've been doing is cutting the tape trimming it up so that i get an emitter pretty close to that row start there i don't want the emitter to be way down here because then i can't maximize the number of plants that i'm going to fit in this row so now that we've got it connected at the beginning, let's trim it up right here and install our row in. So I'm going to clip it uh, about right there. Maybe cut just a little too much when I cut that piece. We'll fold that over. Crimp that there and do the next one. So we got everything installed for that bed of collards. I went ahead and turned the tape on. You can see the lines are inflated there. And I also went ahead and did the install here where our kale is going to go now i put three lines in here i'm going to try to get away with that we shall see so i think i'm going to do curly kale right here on this side of the main line give myself a little more room for that darker bore kale because it kind of spreads out and gets a little bushy and then i'm going to try to do two rows of lacinato kale right here i got one of these lines real close to the edge of the bed i figure the leaves can kind of hang over the side should be just fine but we'll see if it works so we're going to put one of these pretty collar transplants beside each one of these emitters here and kind of cover up the tape as we go should be able to get at least i don't know maybe five or six plants per row here And then now on this side, same thing, one plant beside each emitter. And for the kale, we're going to go curly kale, this darker board variety. It did really well for us last year. We'll do curly kale on this side of the bed here. And we'll do two rows of Lacinato, this black magic variety, on the other side of the bed. So that's two more beds down, still nine more to go, 
and I've been trying to kind of do this in the order of things that are ready in the greenhouse so between the in-ground plot we planted several videos ago and what we have in these beds so far that covers all the transplants that i had ready in the greenhouse that needed to go in the ground most of the rest of the stuff in here will be direct seeded we have lettuce transplants and mustard transplants in the greenhouse they're not quite ready yet so we wanted to plant the transplants that are ready first then we'll do some direct seeding and then hopefully those other transplants will be ready as far as the collards and kale go, this is not near as much collards and kale as I normally plant. So in the past, when we just had the in-ground garden, I would plant a 30-foot row of collards and then a 30-foot row of kale. But we never really needed the entire 30-foot row at one time, except way back when we were selling our veggies. So recently, since we stopped selling the veggies, when I would go harvest a mess of collards or kale for supper, I was really only using a few plants along that row there. I usually didn't even make it to a third of the row before I had enough for a pot full. So in these beds right here, I was able to squeeze 10 collard plants, which would be a third of a row of what I would normally plant in the past. So I think it's going to be a plenty. Now, we may not have near as much to give away to friends and family, but we're gonna have plenty for us here, I think. And that kind of goes back to this slow, slow transition I've been in the last couple of years as we have transitioned from growing to sell to just growing for us and maybe having a little extra for friends and family. It's not as easy as you would think to make that transition. I was used to growing so much and it's hard to cut back drastically. I've been slowly cutting back year after year growing a little bit less and a little bit less till i figure out okay what's the right amount that we need and still have a little bit left over to give away and that was one of the main reasons i wanted to build this raised bed garden here for the veggies where we only need a raised bed full it makes it easier to grow them in here i've never been one to like to plant a half a row of anything and split up different veggies in the same row never seems to work out for me timing wise but in this situation we have these little micro plots of raised beds we can grow just enough there save our in-ground plots for the larger plantings so next on the list, as far as fall planting goes, is gonna be root veggies. So carrots, beets, parsnips, that's what I'm hoping to get planted in here next. So hopefully that's what you'll see on the next video. We'll go through all my carrot tips over the years, how to get those things to germinate well so you have a nice full stand in your in-ground garden or your raised bed. So I hope you enjoyed the video today. It was nice to get those taters healed and make a little more progress here behind me. And let me know in the comments below what you think about all the damage to our no-till pumpkin plot. Do you believe that no-till plants are able to resist insects better or you think that's kind of hogwash? And if you like growing collards, let me know in the comments below how many plants you have found that it takes per person or per family of four on average. How many plants do you have to grow to have enough to pick a big pot's worth at one time? If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to check out our affiliate links below. A lot of great companies that we use in our gardens here at Lazy Dog Farm. Even got some coupon codes for some of those companies so you can take advantage of those discounts. Don't forget to go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com, where we've got lots of good blogs, including one talking about all the pieces we use for this raised bed irrigation system here. We've also got recipes over there, hats, shirts, all kind of good stuff. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like and share and we'll see you next time right here at lazy dog farm Old well mm -hmm. by the beauty of your life